let's go ahead and get started. So, like I said, we have two uh, sort of we have two parts of today's lesson. The first is going to be a continuation of yesterday, which we didn't quite finish. So let's get to it. Trigonometry review continued. So yesterday, we filled out this thing, the unit circle. And we learned that the sine of some angle, the, that the sine of some angle is equal to the x value of a point of x value of the point on the, at that angle on the unit circle. Oh no, I got it backwards. Ah! I made no mistakes yesterday and then today I managed to mess up almost immediately. The sign is the y value. Cosine of theta red marker sort of works, whereas the cosine is the x value of that of a point at that angle. But there's a few things. First of all, there's this thing called tangent, which you've heard of before. And the other is what about these other blank lines? Well, those are for an alternate way of measuring angles called radian measure. Radians are an alternative unit for measuring angles. Whereas, so let's take a moment and talk about where degrees come from. Well, degrees are a really, really old unit. I believe that the use of degrees, dividing up a circle into 360 chunks, goes all the way back to like ancient Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates. And this was done, they would measure angles by drawing a circle and dividing it into 360 little chunks. And they call each chunk a degree. And that is useful. It's really intuitive, but it's actually kind of awkward mathematically because it's because that 360 was chosen entirely arbitrarily. Uh, it was chosen because it was chosen because it was a big number. You know, it's dividing up a circle into like into like four chunks wouldn't really produce useful uh, a high resolution for like telling apart two angles. And 360 is highly divisible. It has a lot of it has a lot of factors. You can divide it by you can divide 360 by two, three, four, five, six. Can't divide it by seven, but you can divide it by eight, by nine, by ten, by twelve. Tons and tons of ways to divide 360. So it was it's easy to do mental math with as well. If you're an ancient Mesopotamian scribe. But like I said, that 360 was chosen arbitrarily. It was just, it could have been anything. They could have divided it up into 720 or 100 bits, and that would have been just as, good, just as good. So mathematicians developed a way of measuring angles that's a little bit more inherent, or that's a, that's a bad, bad word. It's that, that are a little bit more uh, 
that have more to do with the properties of a circle. So radians are an alternative unit. This should be a capital R. Radians are an alternative unit for measuring angles based on the circumference of a unit circle. So if we have a unit circle, radius one, then its circumference all the way around would be two times pi times r, which is one, would be two pi. So we'll say, okay, instead of 360 degrees, we'll call one full revolution of the circle two pi. Half, going halfway around a circle, we'll call that pi radians, because if it was a unit circle, that would be the same as walking a distance of pi around the circle. One full revolution is two pi radians. So half a resolution so half a revolution is half of two is one, so half a revolution is pi radians. Three revolutions. is 6 pi radians, etc. OK, can I take this away? OK, I'll give you a moment. Can I take this away now? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you another 20 seconds. Or let me know when you're done. All right, can I take this away now? Oh yeah, you got it, okay, great. So let's go ahead and fill this out using the unit circle or, or yeah, write down a few more radian measures using the unit circle. Let me just zoom in the camera smidgen, okay. So I'll do this in red just to help it stand out. So these outer measures, or these inner ones, as previously mentioned, are degrees. These other ones 
are radians. And we'll fill in the rest. So before you rotate it all, zero degrees is the same as zero radians. No biggie. And like we said in the previous section, one complete revolution is two pi radians. Which means that half a complete revolution is half of two pi, which is one pi, or just pi. So let's see if we can figure out the rest. <sighs> Giving this lesson always makes me hungry. All this talk of pi. All right, so let's, let's start by figuring out the cardinal directions, up, down, left, right. Okay, well, we already got right and left. So the, the angle here, half of pi, well, what is half of pi? Well, easy enough, half of pi, is half of pi, pi over two. So this angle here is pi over two. Well, here's a half pi, here's two halves of pi. So this angle is, will be one, two, three halves of pi. We could write that as we could write that as three halves pi, but it's generally si more simplified to, to or lo generally looks nicer to write as three pi over two. So this angle here is three pi over two. All right, what's half of a half? Well, if I have half a dollar, what's half of a half dollar? Why that is a quarter, one over four, or alternately, that's pi halves. That's pi halves times pi halves, or pi halves times a half, which is pi over four. So. Half of a half, halfway to, to pi over 2, is pi over 4. So here's 1 quarter, two, uh, 2 quarters, 3 quarters. One quarter, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, five quarters, six quarters, seven quarters of pi back to eight quarters. Eight quarters is the same as two. Now, what about 30? Well, let me see. Uh, 30 is one sixth of 180. So one sixth of pi is pi over six. So one sixth, then two sixths. Two sixths. Simplifies out to one third. So pi over six, pi over three. One sixth, two sixths, three sixths which is pi over two, four sixths, which is two pi over three. So four sixths, five sixths. So five pi over six. 
This lesson always makes me feel like I'm speaking parcel tongue. Okay. Five pi over six. So five sixths, six sixths, seven sixths. Seven pi over six. Seven pi, seven sixths, eight sixths, which simplifies to four pi over three. 4 pi over 6, uh, or that's uh, 8 6, 9 6, which simplifies to 3 halves, 10 6, which simplifies to 5 pi over 3, and then finally 11 6. There we go. So note that, for example, just as an example, uh, 350 degrees is the same as 7 pi over 4 radians. They're just two different ways of measuring the exact same thing. Now, most calculators, including Desmos, use radians by default. Radians are kind of more the, uh, like I said, radians come from this property that's inherent to circles, the circumference of a circle. So they're actually in a lot of ways more convenient to do math with. Um, uh, and so calculators will usually default to radians. For a TI to change to radian mode, to change it between having it use radians and degrees, you click the mode button and you can choose whether what unit you want it to use. Oops. Mode and then select the one I want and then press enter. There we go. And that is radian measure. Now, a few things to talk about before we move on to talking about arctangent. Since these are both units representing the same thing, that means that we can have a conversion formula. if I want to convert radians to degrees, or vice versa. So first, the radian to degree formula. This is if I have a problem that's giving to me in radians and I don't want to work with radians, I want to work in degrees. To convert from radians to degrees, you take our radian measure, then you multiply by 180 and you divide by pi. To go the other way around, from degrees to radians, you take your our degree measure and multiply by pi over 180. This will give us our radian measure. Easy as that. Now, I know that I have this nice physical unit circle that I filled out for you. And if you were in the classroom, then I would have had you fill out a blank one of these yourself. And I would have just had you use it. But in the absence of that, you're going to have to make do with the version that I put up into Canvas that's already filled out for you. I don't want to, didn't want to assume that everybody has a printer. So just to make, make sure you know how to get to that unit circle, let me share my screen really quick. So this is the screen that I see when I'm in Canvas. What you see and what I see is a little bit different, but you'll still see it in the same place. 
If you go to modules, you will find the unit circle, whoa, here. Click on that. It's not wanting to load. Hold on. Let me just click on that. Click on that, click open. There we go. So here we have a nice unit circle for you. We can see that it has the points here on the outside, which remember, that's how we can calculate sines and cosine. The y values tell us sine, the x values tell us cosine. This number here is our radian measure at that angle, and that is our angle in degrees. So this has all the same information that's over here on the physical one, but it's one that you can easily access. And if you want, you can print it out. Also note that down here, or that down here at the bottom of the page, it tells you how to calculate sine, cosine, and tangent. Your sine value is equal to the y value divided by the r, it's a unit circle, so r is always 1, which means that sine of theta is always the y-coordinate. Cosine of theta is always the x-coordinate. And tangent is always y divided by x. We'll talk about tangent in just a moment. So you can find this in your learning module. All right. So that is everything that, we have, that I have to say about radians. All right, can I take this conversion formula away? No one is telling me no. Where did I put my eraser? Oh, over here. All right. So now we're going to talk about how to find an angle using arctangent. So what is tangent? Well, remember the triangle we had yesterday, angle here, the opposite is whatever is on the opposite side from the angle. The adjacent is next to it. The hypotenuse is opposite the right angle. We saw that sine is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. And it measures verticality. Cosine. is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. And it measures horizontality. The last one is called tangent. And tangent is the opposite divided by the adjacent. And tangent measures how square it is. This, the more, the closer the opposite and the adjacent are to each other, the closer tangent will get to one. The more imbalanced one or the, one or the other is, the further away from one it will get. Now, the most important and useful feature about tangent is this thing called arctangent, or inverse tangent. Now, we've already talked, talked about this before, but just want to make sure that 
this is something that everybody knows because it's very, very important. We'll, and we'll talk more about arc tangent and then also arc sine, arc cosine later in the course. But this is pretty important and foundational. So if you know the opposite and the adjacent You can find theta using the formula The arc tangent of opposite over adjacent equals theta. Now, this is not really something that is easily done in your head. So use a calculator or use Desmos or something. It, it can be done with your head or by hand, but only for special, e easy to work with angles. So for example, if I have something like if I have something like, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to find theta. And I know that this side has a length of eight. And this side has a length of, let's say, 14. The angle is going to be the arctan of the opposite, which is 8, over 14. Stick that sucker in a calculator. Arctan of 8 over 14. And it gives me 0.519. Hmm. Well, 0.519, that doesn't look like 0 0.51 degrees. But it does look like 0 0.51 radians. Remember, most calculators work in radians. So this is 0 0.51 radians. Which, if we change our calculator to degree mode, will tell us that this is also about 29.7 degrees, which I'll round off to, well, I'll say 29.7, which is about equal to 29.7 degrees. Fair enough? All right. So this is kind of the very, very basic crash course into arc tangent. We're going to well, we're going to be using it from time to time to calculate angles. That said, it is also important to know to know some special triangles as well. The 45, 45, 90 triangle, and as well as the 30, 60, 90 triangle that we looked at yesterday. All right. So go ahead and make sure that you have this down. I'll give you about 20 seconds.
All right. Uh, here, this is 0 0.51 rad. So I'll type that in the text box. That is 0 0.51 rad, which is about equal to 29.7 degrees. All right. Can I take this away? No one's telling me no. All right, so I know that that was kind of a quick and dirty cr uh, crash through through some uh, trigonometry stuff, radian measure, arc tangent. Now we're getting to the to the main lesson today, which is about. Transforming shapes using complex numbers. Our objective is that y'all will be able to transform geometric shapes using complex numbers. Pretty straightforward title and objective, I know. All right. All right, so let's get to it. Now, today's lesson is pretty cool. I actually think that what we do in today's lesson is really neat. You know, if you're like a, if you're like, I don't know, a dorky guy like me. So, so I'm going to introduce a new notation for you. It's not actually that new. We used it to transform. We used it to transform shapes back in lesson like one, honestly. So, so yeah, let's recall transform. Uh, let's let's recall using function notation to transform shapes. or to transform things, transform numbers. So it 
if we have some function or some transformation L of Z equals let equals uh, some equals uh, let's say some number times Z. We can plug. numbers, well, actually, let's use x instead of z. If, so if we have some transformation like L of x equals 4 times x, we can plug in numbers to transform them. And this would be an example of a linear transformation, if you recall correctly. Lin there, there was that set of rules for defining what linear transformations look like, that L of x plus y needs to be equal to L of x plus L of y, and so forth. This is a linear transformation because it's just a number times x. But here's the cool thing. Our inputs, and for that matter, the, the coefficient here, do not have to be real numbers. They can also be complex numbers. OK. So can I erase this? Okay, I'll give you a moment. We good? Can I take this away? All right. Now, in a transformation, like L In a transformation like L of x equals 4 times x, we don't have to plug in real numbers. We can plug in complex numbers as well. If we do that, then we'll want to change these x's to z's, just because that's the convention. x generally represents real numbers. z generally represents complex numbers. Now remember, that complex numbers
are essentially geometric points. You know, you can graph a complex number and a point the same way. And since shapes, since a geometric shape, like a square, is itself made of points, this means that we can transform whole shapes by writing down their points as complex numbers and running each of those points through our transformation. I'll give you about 30 seconds. All right, can I take this away so we can try an example? No one is yelling at me. All right. Let me see, where is it? Here we go. So I'm going to introduce a special shape to you called the unit square. So, the unit square. The unit square is defined as the square 
with one corner on the origin and each other corner and all of its corners extending out into the first quadrant. So I'm actually going to zoom this in a little bit. Call that one, two, three, one, two, three. All right. So unit square is the square with the vertices at zero, zero. One zero, one one, and zero one. And I'll call these points A, B, C, and D. Let's draw the shape resulting from transforming a unit square with L of Z equals, let's use the same one we were using, four times Z. And then let's describe the geometric effect. All right. So this really shouldn't be too too difficult. Now, I said a moment ago that we will do this by writing down the points as complex numbers, and then we'll input those into the transformation. So what is 0, 0 as a complex number? What is point A as a complex number? Oh, before we do, I should draw the unit square. Has one vertex at zero, zero, which I'll call A. One vertex at one, one, which is called B. One vertex at one, one, which you call C. And one vertex at zero, one, which we call D. All right. And there's our unit square. So anyway, A as a complex number, help me out. So in type zero, the point zero, zero as a complex number, how would I write that? Mm -hmm. Well, someone, someone wrote this. They wrote zero comma zero I, and they're really, really close. They know what they're doing. They're thinking, okay, I'm going over zero and up zero. But this is not as a complex number. All complex numbers are written as A plus BI. So they're really, really close. It just means we just need to write it zero plus zero I. Make sense? So what is B?
Someone help me out. What is B as a complex number? One plus zero I? Exactly. One plus zero I. Should be picking, hopefully you're picking this up by now. What is C? One plus one I. One plus one I, or simply one plus I, because one times I is I. And finally, D? Zero plus I. Exactly. Okay. Now that we have our A, B, C, and D as a complex number, or as complex numbers, now we can plug them into this function here. So, L of A, that's going to be 4 times a, so that's 4 times 0 plus 0 i. Distribute 4 times 0, that's 0. 4 times 0 i, that's 0 i. So L of a of 0 plus 0 i. We will call this point a prime, a with a little apostrophe. What is L of B? Well, that is one. That is that is going to be four times one plus zero i. Distribute the sucker in there, and we get four plus zero i. And we will call that B prime. L of C, that is 4 times C, which is 1 plus I. Distribute it again, and we have 4 plus 4I. Four and finally, L of D. four times zero plus i, that is zero plus four i. And these are c prime and d prime. So let's go ahead and draw these points. Well, there's a prime. A didn't move at all. But B prime is now at 4 plus 0i. It's here. C prime is 4 plus 4i. And finally, D prime. is 0 plus 4i. Connect the dots, and we have our shape. So, what happened to our shape when we multiplied it by 4? What is it called when a, sh a shape expands like this? It now expanded. Someone in the chat wrote dilate. expand. Yeah, yeah, exactly, dilate. Expanded is correct. You know, that's that is like 
the correct word we'd use in English, but this is math class. So we'll use mathies, which is it dilated. So it dilated. How much did it dilate? How many times how many times bigger did it get? Well, it dilated. We call that the scale factor. And yeah, uh, you're, you're exactly right, Devon. It dilated with a scale factor. of four. Fair enough. And does that make sense? When we multiply a shape by a number, or when we multiply a complex number by a real number, dilation is what we expect to see. So this does not surprise us. All right, can I take this away? Okay, I'll give you a moment. We'll do one more together, then we'll do one more together, then I'll uh, give you one to try on your own. Okay, we good. All right, let's go ahead and try another one. This one will also will also do the unit square. So we'll transform the unit square. using L of Z equals, let's say I times Z. Now our A is still the same A, it's zero plus zero I. Our B is still the same B, one, uh, one plus zero I, so on and so forth. All right. So let's go ahead and transform the unit square using these rules, I'll, or using that rule. I'll, I'll uh, draw this out really quick, just so that we have our starting place. B, C, D, connect dots. There we go. My beautiful unit square. It is gorgeous. Okay, so let's go ahead and find L of each of these points. So L of A, that is going to be I times A, which is zero plus zero I. If we distribute this in here, I times zero is zero, zero I is the same as zero times i is zero again. So we end up with zero plus zero i again, and this is our a prime. Now let's try L of b. That's going to be i times b, which is one plus zero i. We can distribute this in here. What is one times i?
Uh, yeah, C is, someone asked privately in the chat, is C 1 plus I? Yeah, that is 1 plus I. So what is I times 1? I times 1 is, well, anything times 1 is I. I times 0I. Zero, 0 times I is 0. 0 times 0 is 0. So we have I plus 0. But we usually like putting the imaginary part second. So this is 0 plus I, which is our B prime. L of C. OK, this one is going to be the one that's a little bit trickier, but you've done much harder than these. I times 1. What I times 1 is indeed I. Thank you, secret person in the chat. And what is I times I? Negative 1. Exactly. And this is our C prime. And finally, D. <sighs> OK, I times 0 plus I. Anything times 0 is 0. No biggie there. And I times I, like we just said, is negative 1. So this is actually going to be negative 1 plus 0 I. And that is our D prime. All right, so we have our points. A is at 0 plus 0 I. B prime is at 0 plus I. C prime is at negative 1 plus I. And D prime is at negative 1 plus 0 I. And there we have it. So what happened to our shape? What happened to the unit square? So I've seen a couple, a couple of ants. I see a couple of answers. You're saying that it moved to the left, or uh, translated is the technical term. But I'm going to tell you, no, this was not a translation. And I'll tell you why. Give me just a moment. I'm looking to see if I have a manipulative here that might be handy. Okay, this will do. Now, you might think, well, it was here. Now it's to the left. So it translated to the left, right? But that's not quite it. A translation to the left would mean that every point would move to the left. Like if I have something like this, starting here, a translation would mean that everything would just move to the left. But that's not what happened. Look at each of these points. Did A move at all? Yeah. A a didn't move at all. OK, now, so now a couple of people are changing their thoughts. OK, is it a reflection? Well, it might be. It looks like if A would reflect, if it reflected over the y-axis, then it would end up at the same place. But t and that sure looks like C reflected. C went over to here. But look, did B reflect over here?
Now, admittedly, my handwriting is like not great, but B ended up up here. That does not look like a reflection to me. Exactly. So it rotated. Take a look. If we follow point B and it rotates like that, or actually let's use, do it like this. It rotated like so. Does that make sense? Our A is acting like the, the fulcrum around which the whole thing is rotating. Our point C is going to there. Our point B, well, our point B, this corner here, is ending up right there. It rotated. Now, this is one of the reasons why, oh, why we would want to transform, do transformations with shapes like this at all. Because if this was just a single point, like say C, if we didn't have A, B, and D all at the same time, it would be kind of hard to tell. Why would, why, why that would be moving? Is that a translation or reflection or rotation? But when we have all of the points together like this, then we can identify how it's, how it worked, what exactly happened. So how far did it rotate? Well, it rotated 90 degrees. And again, this is made nice and clear with this die. It was pointing that way. Now it rotates 90 degrees and now it's pointing that way. So, The shape rotated 90 degrees. Fair enough? It's one of those things that's kind of hard to recognize, but then when you see it, oh, it's beautiful. All right. So I'm going to give you one for you to try yourself really quick. Can I erase stuff? No one's yelling at me? Okay. I'm going to ask you to transform the unit square using L of Z equals negative 2 times Z and describe the effect. So I'll help you get started. We're using the same A's, B's, C's, and D's. So I'll start by drawing out the unit square here. One, one. OK. We're using the same points, A, B, C, and D. So A is 0 plus 0i, B is 1 plus 0i, C is 1 plus i, D is 0 plus i. Find L of A, L of B, 
L of C, L of D, plot the points, see what it's doing, describe what it's doing. Give it a shot. I'll give you about two minutes. All right. So I'm going to skip the actual math doing, because I'm assuming you did that yourself. Negative 2 times 0 plus 0i, that's going to give us 0 plus 0i. Zero and that's our a prime. L of b, 1 plus 0i times negative 2, that's going to give you negative 2 plus 0i. That is B prime. L of C, you should have gotten negative 2 minus 2i, which is C prime. And L of D should have gotten you 0 plus 2i, which should be D prime. So plot the points. There's a prime, B prime is left two, so one, two. C prime is left two down two to here. And D prime is there. B to B, B to C. C to D, D back to A. And there we go. Oh, uh, yeah, someone wrote in the private chat that this should be negative 2i. My bad. Thank you. All right. So there we have it. Now, uh, what happened to our shape? Well, first of all, it looks like it dilated, right? It dilated with a scale factor of 2, or you could just say dilated by 2. But it also rotated. B was pointing to the right, but now it's pointing to the left. D was pointing up, but now it's rotating, pointing down. C was pointing to the upper right, now it's pointing to the lower left. So exactly, it rotated around the origin 180 degrees. Whew. 
All right. Now we're running out of time. I'm sorry, for, I am sorry, but we still have to do one more example before you'll be able to, before you'll be able to handle the check for understanding. All right. So, can I erase this? No one's telling me no, so I'm a so I'm a erase, and actually erase this time. Alrighty, A, B, C, D, okay. So we'll try the same thing, but this time we'll try multiplying our shape by a complex number. Let's say, just to pull some numbers off the top of my head, let's say uh, two plus three I. Actually, I'm just going to make it 2 plus i, 2 plus i times z, and describe the geometric effect. So what on earth is this going to do? Maybe it'll like stretch or squeeze the shape in some weird way. Maybe it won't be a square anymore. Let's find out. L of a, well, a is the same it's always been, 0 plus 0 i. B is one plus, or B is one plus zero I. Oh, zero plus I. L of A, well, that's going to be two plus I times zero plus zero I. L of B is going to be one plus or is going to be two plus i times one plus zero i. L of c is going to be one plus i, or ah, two plus i times one plus i. And L of d is going to be zero plus i time, ah, dang it, 2 plus i times 0 plus i. There we go. A, B, C, D, the numbers we're multiplying by. All right. Well, first of all, anything times 0 is always 0. That's nice and easy. Now, 1 plus 0 i, that's the same thing as 1, right? Anything times 1 is itself. This one's going to be a little bit more of a pain in the neck. 2 times 1 is 2. I'll just do my math over here. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 2i, two plus i. i times i is negative 1. So this gives us 1 plus 3i. 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times i is 2i, i times 0 is 0, i times i is negative 1. So let's plot these points and see the result. A, A prime is pretty much where we expected it, right there. But B prime is at 2 plus I here. C prime is at 1 plus 3I here. And D prime 
is at negative 1 plus 2i. Oh, I put b prime at not quite the right spot. There it is. And d prime is here. Connect the dots. And we have ourselves a shape. So what happened to our rectangle? Well, it seems to have dilated and rotated again. But the question is, how much did it dilate? Well, if you think about it, this side here used to have a length of 1, but now it has a length that is equal to 2 plus i, the number we multiplied it by. So it dilated by the modulus. of 2 plus i. And it rotated. Well, this used to have an angle of 0 degrees, but everything got tilted by exactly that angle there. The argument of 2 plus i. And that makes it very clear what happens to a shape when I multiply it by a complex number. When you multiply a shape by a complex number, you rotate it by the modulus, or sorry, you rotate it by the argument of whatever your, the argument of the complex number is. And you dilate it by the modulus of whatever that complex number is. All right. Uh, I had to go a little bit faster than I normally like. I was hoping to do some examples, but there wasn't really time. You know, do a few more examples, like multiplying by 2i, that sort of thing, multiplying by different co other complex numbers. But because of, because of the time crunch, we're going to have to call it there. Now, uh, so we'll go ahead and leave it off there. Today, we saw how we learned how to, to uh, transform a shape by multiplying it by, by some number. We can convert that shape, in, or the, you can convert the vertexes, the vertices of that shape, into complex numbers and plug those into the transformation. Then you can just draw the resulting shape and see what you get. In particular, we saw that multiplying a complex number by a shape causes it to rotate and also dilate. So the bell, such as it is, will ring in about two minutes. But I do have a check for understanding assignment for you. you can uh, you can tackle it whenever you have the time. It is not currently enabled. Give me about two seconds and I'll publish it. Beep. Okay. Uh, in which you are looking at a shape that has been transformed and you need to try to figure out what complex or what transformation resulted in that shape. So with that, that's about everything we need to talk about. Does anyone have any last minute questions before I end the session?
All right. I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. It's crazy that it's Wednesday already. See you guys tomorrow.